don't waste your time trying to live someone else's life. You know, don't be trapped by dogma. Focus in on your own strengths, your own element, what you have to offer. Don't get lost in trying to become like someone else or pretend to be someone else. There's a beautiful, one of my favorite quotes by Einstein and then Steve Jobs again. Einstein said, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will spend its whole life believing that it's stupid. And too many of us are fish trying to climb a tree. Too many of us are monkeys being taught how to swim. Too many of us are lions being taught to live like cats. We're not getting to live in our element. So my second piece of advice is live in that element that you've naturally been given. Don't try to adopt another. You know, we've all got a special genius inside of us. It was Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs, this conversation. Steve Wozniak, look, Steve Wozniak, for those who don't know, is the tech guy behind Apple. He practically invented the technology and the software and everything. So Steve Wozniak looked at Steve Jobs and he says, this is in Walter Isaacson's biography of Steve Jobs. Steve Wozniak, Wozniak looks at Steve Jobs and he says, what do you even do? He said, you're not a coder, you're not a designer, mm -hmm. you're not a marketer, and you're not an engineer. What do you even do? Imagine challenging Steve Jobs. And Steve Jobs replies, he says, he says, musicians play their instruments, I play the orchestra. That is the most deep understanding of one's role in life and not getting lost in other people's identities and perceptions of you. Steve Jobs knew that he wasn't a marketer, he wasn't an engineer, he wasn't a coder, so he hired one of those. But he played the orchestra, he brought it all together. And that's when you, when you find confidence in your own role, you won't be envious of anyone. Any of you have a crazy dream or a crazy goal, I want you to write out in the comment section, what is your crazy dream? The dream that keeps you up at night is the real dream you should be chasing. But to chase that dream, to find that dream, to make that dream a reality, you need a strategy, right? A dream without a plan is just a wish. Tony Robbins said that, right? A dream without a plan is just a wish, right? Without a strategy, without a guiding philosophy, without guiding principles, without actually creating a clear plan. I used to have this economics teacher, and I want you to think back to school as well. Maybe you had one. I remember this economics teacher. He walked in to the classroom, and the first thing that he wrote on the board, he didn't even tell us his name. We didn't even know who he was. And he turned up, he went inside the classroom, and he wrote on the board, he said, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. And all of us just burst out laughing. This guy hadn't even told us his name yet. But on the board, he wrote, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. And now when I look back at that, and as I grew up and hopefully became a bit more mature than I was in high school, I remember thinking about that statement. I'm thinking, how true is that? That when you're not prepared for something, you miss out on unbelievable opportunities. Now, I'm not saying good things don't happen spontaneously. Sometimes things happen by chance, randomly, etc., with a reason. But when you're prepared, you can capitalize on things in a huge, huge way. Mark Zuckerberg said it brilliantly at Harvard. He was saying that finding your purpose isn't enough. You have to help other people find theirs. And I know you're passionate about this. Whatever that definition is, but it has to lead everyone. So if I, whether I meet a celebrity, an entrepreneur, or whether I meet somebody starting out, I'm always asking them the question, how can you use what you have to make a difference in the life of other people? Yeah. Because if you start there, everything else will work out. But if you're starting from the point of, what am I going to get? Then you're always going to feel disconnected. Mm -hmm. And I see that, I see people who live like that and feel pain in their lives every day. I see that. It's not like some conceptual philosophy. We see it. I see people who are only in it for themselves and they feel disconnected, dissatisfied every single day. And then you see the other extreme where people are just trying to give too much more than they even have themselves and they also feel disconnected. Wow. And again, and they have so, nothing at all. And they have nothing at all, right? So we know, again, <clears throat> Attachment and aversion, two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. So we want to be in that dynamic balance of growth, but always to give. Yeah. So I always think, how can I go three steps deeper so that I can move three steps forward so I can give three times as much? Right? It's, well, that's always my mentality. How do I go deeper to go more forward to give more? Yeah. And if I can get those three in action for that reason. See, it's all about the reasoning. You can do anything you like, but it's why are you doing it? Yeah. You know what's right. Yeah. It's incredible that we root for underdogs. It's incredible that we want underdogs to win. Why? Because we're used to wanting our team to win. We're used to wanting the best to win. 
We're used to wanting to associate ourselves with people who are successful, right? We never go, oh yeah, I know someone who plays for that really bad team. Like, we don't say that, right? We say things like, oh, I know someone who plays for that really good team. I know someone who was MVP. I know someone who's the son or the daughter of the MVP. We try and associate or link ourselves to success. And when we do that, it in turn makes us feel more successful. It's one of the reasons why when your team wins, you say, we won, right? You say, we won. But when someone asks you, oh, how did your team do? And if they lost that day, you say, they lost. You rarely say, we lost. It's incredible how psychologically we distance ourselves from failure and we closen or liken ourselves to success. But the exception to that rule is the underdog. We all get excited by underdogs. We all get motivated by underdogs. We feel completely enamored by the story of the underdog. Prashant, underdogs are just simple-minded. They don't have expectations and don't have anything to prove to anybody. And Prashant, you've just hit the nail on the head. That's the principle I'm trying to get across. Actually, we should play like champions and train like underdogs. Why? Because the underdog works in a way not worrying about what anybody else thinks or believes. That gives you an edge. It gives you a phenomenal advantage when you're actually worried about what will people say when you're not concerned by am I going to fail am I going to look worse is what I'm doing not going to succeed as an underdog you don't let those things cloud your mind you can focus in on the task at hand see when we become successful even as underdogs if we've risen to success the biggest enemy of that success the biggest Achilles heel the biggest thing that can trip us up is not reconnecting to that feeling of an underdog. So no matter how much success you've achieved, no matter where you are, always remind yourself the mindset of an underdog is the mindset that nurtures talent, that nurtures success, that harnesses your true potential. Almost 30 and I don't feel like I've accomplished anything in life. I made a promise to myself while I was at university that I would get a job that excites me every morning. But right now I'm afraid I'm not going in that direction. That note was written by a young person and when I read it, my heart sank. I felt that way because I know so many people that are in that exact position. I remember when I decided to trade my 9 to 5 for a 24 7, it was because I wanted to do something that was meaningful every day. I wanted to do something that was purposeful and fulfilling from the moment I woke up to the moment I went to sleep. The one thing I didn't know before I started is how achievable that was, but also what it required. When I transitioned from my 9 to 5, or actually my 9 to 9, to a 24 7, I realized that I was going to have to work harder, smarter, and faster. And that step was was full of fear, full of anxiety, full of insecurity, full of questions like, what will happen if it doesn't work? What will people say? Should I just have stayed where I was? I went through all of those emotions all at the same time, and then something came to me. I wrote down the various options that I had in life at the time, and I wrote a word above them that I believe summarized the experience or the result of what I thought that would give me. Some of them said ego, because I thought those career paths would give me a boost to my ego. Some said security, because there were certain roles or jobs I could take that would provide a certain level of financial security. And then one path said the word love, because I knew if I did that, that I would love every moment, even if it was truly challenging and sometimes really difficult to deal with. And that's why I'm here today, making this video, speaking to all of you, because I chose the path that had the word love above it. Try that exercise, try that activity out to try and differentiate the motive, the intention behind what you're choosing and selecting in life. Now, just because you choose the word love doesn't mean that everything's going to be smooth sailing and that you're going to be successful. It's going to have its own ups and downs. And that's why wherever you go with your heart, take your head with you. It's always that same question. What's the ROI on social media? Right? What's the ROI? Now the funny thing is, your business work and service, my business work and service literally lives off of social media. So there's obviously an ROI. But the problem is we live in a world where we want everything to be measurable. And there's a beautiful Einstein quote that says, not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that you can count counts, mm -hmm. right? And we live in this world where everything needs to be measured. Like, oh, that video has a million views. How many sales did you get through that? But it's like life doesn't work like that. There's a load of adverts and billboards on the street that the biggest brands pay for that don't convert into direct sales. Do you think that Coca-Cola looks at the billboard out there and goes, how many people saw that advert today and how many people bought a Coca-Cola because of that advert? They don't have that number, it doesn't exist. And they're one of the biggest brands in the world, but they still do it. So social media and video is just a new billboard. Mm -hmm. 
And the biggest brands know that the more you see it, like, I mean, <laughs> this is funny, I saw this today, I saw a big billboard outside of my hotel that has all the Jenners and the Kardashians wearing their Calvins. Have you yeah, seen it? Yeah. Right, I saw it straight away this morning, then I saw it on Instagram, and then I saw it everywhere. So already, I've seen it in three places. Now, I don't need women's Calvin yeah, yeah. underwear, but the point is that I've seen it in a million places. So anyone who's not using video hasn't understood that more people are gonna see video than anything else. And not just that, video is so much better than a billboard. You can say so much more. Right. So for me, it's just a lack of seeing opportunity. There's a, there's a great, I think this is a, a old tale, it's not true, but, but it's told that when Nike first went to India, they went there, and it's not Nike, it's any, any sneaker brand, it's, it's, it's a nice story. And when they first went to India, they saw everyone was barefoot. <clears throat> so the first reporter came back and said, oh, there's no market there because no one wears trainers. Yeah. And then the second reporter went then he said, oh, no one wears shoes. And then he came back and says, we've got a huge market out there. Right? And it's the way you see it. That right, right, someone right. saw no one wearing shoes as no market, but another person saw everyone not wearing shoes as a market. Right. And that's what video is. That you can sit here and debate the ROI on video for as long as you want. The truth is, every major brand has invested in a front window that may not translate to direct sales or work or whatever it is, but it does. Do you think every brand should be using video? Every brand should be using video. There's an incredible study in 2017 that said the most successful people in the world, healthy, wealthy, and wise, choose education over entertainment. The impact I want to have from the world is I want to transform and revolutionize the entertainment industry so that it becomes educational without anyone knowing. So it's still completely entertaining. It's still like watching Netflix, but you're learning about human behavior, the mind, neuroscience, and everything without even knowing you are. To me, that's the greatest win that we can have for our society. How many people are gonna quit watching Netflix and reading a book every night? I don't know. But if we can make that book come to life on Netflix, that's gonna change the world because that's what people are gonna consume. So for so long, media has been used to numb people, to, to switch people off. If we can use it to excite, elevate, enlighten people, not by just, not by like the cheesy way of like, oh, let's follow someone through their journey of enlightenment. It's not like that kind of stuff. I mean like really entertaining programming where you can learn by being entertained at the same time. If I can do that by changing the, the most powerful industry in the world, then I will feel that I've had some, some what of an impact. Because that way I think we'll reach the world without having to get everyone to change their habits too much.